Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm really thrilled to see you all here. We're celebrating today that we have launched a nature-inspired solution, special interest group. I gathered a lot of interesting um, people that I have um, met in the past, and it will be a very exciting day. But first, I want to get to know you a bit better. And actually, I do know you because thanks for sending all um, filling out when you registered what your challenges are and what you're working in in nature inspired engineering. But I want to give the opportunity to other people to get to know you as well. So for everybody who's scared, this is the part of audience participation. <laughs> so who has been to a KTN event before? Okay, let's do the other way around. Who hasn't been to a KTN before? All right, good. Always good to get new people in. Uh, who works in industry? Right, thank you very much. Who works in academia? Good spread, perfect. Who works for the government? And uh, who else? Any investors in the house? All right, I will notice these faces. <laughs> Good. Brilliant. So mainly, um, three more questions. So mainly, who came here because he has a big problem and wants to solve it? Right. So we can discuss that then in the workshop at the end. And who um, has uh, something to present, uh, inspired, uh, nature-inspired technology? Great. And who came just for the lunch? <laughs> okay, I note you, I note you there. Brilliant. So let's move on. I really want to... Um... Uh, okay, I just move it on like that. So yeah, that's my welcome. And I uh, really want to um, introduce the team who helped me to put that together. So, um, as we're really stretched in time, my most important person at the beginning is my colleague Jake here at the front, who uh, will be our timekeeper. Obviously, Ali to set up all the technology. Uh, Poonam, you met downstairs, always friendly, uh, from our events team and always very professional. Um, who else do we have? We have Jenny, our comms lady. Give us a wave, Jenny. Yeah, Jenny will go around and uh, or ask you questions. Uh, so don't be um, frightened. She's very friendly. Um, then obviously she's stepping in for Ellen, who helped me bring everybody in the room. Uh, then we have George somewhere. Yeah, our autonomous uh, specialist. Dana, synthetic biology. Give us a wave, Dana. Um, and um, of course we have uh, more people coming later on. So Brian, our materials expert, for example. And also want to mention that I'm proud that we have our director here, um, Colin Tatum in the back, you want to give a wave. So he's responsible for more than the three sectors that we are targeting, so infrastructure, transport and energy. Brilliant, let's move on. Yeah, that's me. I didn't, I always forget to introduce myself. So I'm Monica. And you can please do get in touch. I hope I can speak to as many as possible today. But time, uh, we have a lot of networking time, so hopefully we have a chance. And if not, do come, you know, do approach me after. You have to do that bit. Uh, just because I think fire is the most important. So obviously, if you don't smoke, we don't want to have a fire. If you want to smoke, smoke outside. Um, it's not good for you, but if you have to, do it. Um, and um, obviously, if there's a fire alarm, we just have to head out where we came in. So basically, straight down the stairs. And I have seen a fire alarm a week before. Uh, it worked so smoothly. I, I, it's amazing how in the UK a fire alarm can be dealt with. So I want to see that here again, if that happens. Uh, obviously, we have uh, downstairs, we have the showcase area 
where there's also the ladies' toilet, and then we have one further down, the gentlemen's toilet. Um, I think that's the most important bits from rules and regulations. One more thing. I really would like to ask you, be with us today. You know, allow yourself the time to switch off your work and come in the room and be with us. If you have to work, I understand, of course, just put your stuff on silence. Thanks very much. That already brings me to the overview of today. <coughs> so, um, we have a good number of uh, presenters, as I said, and um, just because they have enormous long titles and are really all very important people, I just um, put first names here, just to make it easier. So I will start right after the introduction. I will host today, but I will also give a short pre presentation on nature inspired solutions. Then uh, we have uh, Marc Olivier uh, from uh, UCL, um, Center of Nature Inspired Engineering. And he will give you a really interesting insight in how the methodology actually works. And um, also some examples, quite cool things. Uh, and then we have our showcase presenters. And I also have to say uh, what I didn't mention before. We do, uh, because we had such an uh, interest in the event, we also stream um, live. So is everything all right with uh, webcast? Obviously, I did not mention Mark, who is my boss. Okay, I think I will be told off afterwards. <laughs> and he will help the people in the, um, with the webcast. Uh, and sort of um, answer questions and stuff like that. So welcome to everybody at home. Uh, I will encourage uh, speakers to please use the, use the microphone because obviously I could uh, talk loud enough to fill the room without the microphone, but then nobody at home can hear me. So please use the microphone here on the lectern or handheld if you prefer. Right. Um, so, as I said, as I was saying, showcase presentations, only five minutes because I really wanted to give you a taste and a sense what's possible. And there will be time, obviously for the people in the room, to look at the showcases downstairs where there's also food. So it's quite nice to have a chat and meet people and so on. And um, then after the coffee break, which is about half an hour, and I will give you the times as we go along, um, then we have um, Gillian who will speak about the bioeconomy strategy because we want to get, uh, you know, we are not on our own, so we are in a, in a bigger picture and we want to understand that, um, how we could work together. Uh, and then I have an exciting example from Airbus. Uh, Lian, I think is not, are you here? Yes, here you are. Um, will give us um, some insight in their work in bioinspired technology. And then we have very brave Daniel who will say, oh, uh, we have that problems at, at TFL uh, and uh, actually they have problems. Uh, oh, let, don't say problems, we have challenges <laughs> because they obviously infrastructure, they have lots to do. Transport is their main business and energy, if the energy gets out, cuts out, very curious how that works. I must say today as I was coming, it worked all very, very smoothly. I was here 10 minutes earlier, thanks to TFL. <laughs> so um, then we have a, a long lunch break where you can also look at the showcases again and also look, um, uh, do a lot of networking. And then uh, in the afternoon, um, 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 so um, Webster from Innovate UK will be coming and give some insight on how you could get money for projects. And then uh, I will do a quick wrap up and then will be a very interesting part, the workshop, where we look at the key questions that you have asked us and also give a sense and taste. Brilliant. So that's that. So swiftly moving on to the first speaker, who would be me. <laughs> I wonder who does the program here. So, what is a nature-inspired solutions special interest group? Uh, really, uh, the three main things in a that we want to address or that we want to do. It's the three things are connect, educate, and translate. 
So basically, uh, it's very, very simple. Connect, obviously, uh, what we are, and we want to form a network. Of the one side, people that are, have challenges, and on the other hand, people who have solutions for that. And then with our focus, we want that nature-inspired. Uh, I will show that in more detail in a bit. Um, we want to educate because it's not everything, you know, when I was wonder, like yesterday evening to get, you know, to settle my nerves for the event, when I was uh, walking around in nature, obviously I'm inspired, but that is not uh, what I mean. So it's looking into in depth, you know, into the, into, you know, digging deep. And then obviously the main thing why we are here uh, and what we want to achieve for the Knowledge Transfer Network is we want to try to commercialize and help commercialize technology. So I had already on coming in, I had a very interesting chat uh, with, you know, we have really interesting people who have great ideas. So hopefully, uh, ideally today in a workshop we start, but then if not, if you have ideas and you want to help, you know, translate in, uh, them into the big market, just approach me or someone of the team and uh, we will help to find money and to find the right contacts and basically, um, you know, f find you help. I'm sure we can do that. And this is basically also what we do at the Knowledge Transfer Network anyway. So if you say connect, that's the network, educate, that's the knowledge, you know, share the knowledge and then translate it, that's the transfer. So really it's nothing new. The new thing is that we have a, want to form a new community around nature-inspired engineering and different technologies. So what is nature? Basically for the definition, you will hear a lot about animals today in the showcases and you will hear a, a bit about um, plants as well uh, from Marc Olivier and myself. Uh, and it's, as I mentioned, look really deep and look in and then basically, oh, I didn't move that forward, sorry. Um, so look under the underlying mechanism. It will get clearer after Marc Olivier's uh, presentation. Um, I think I skipped my example. Um, yeah, it's about throwing a fruit and what you can learn from a fruit for, um, for damping because this amazing fruit, the pomelo, can, you, know, you can throw it from 10 meters and it doesn't break. And then you could use that as a buffer damping for, air, for um, automotive aerospace, whatever. But very quickly, because this is the most important slide, um, so, to get a sense, uh, obviously we have challenges in industry wherever, but we want to focus on the three key areas, transfer, energy and infrastructure, and then use, use the question, ideally I would like to see that you come from the industry with questions to me, to us, from the team, and then we go into the academia or in other companies that work on the problems that are either working in biomechanics, materials, chemical engineering like Marc Olivier, biotech, robotics, whatnot. And then we try to find a solution for you. And they look at nature. So nature actually is not on the picture, it's sort of here. So that's it. Where are we at the moment? At the moment uh, we have, I'm, I've seen so many amazing things in academia uh, across the UK. That is just a, a couple of universities up there. Uh, we have, I've seen a lot of interesting companies, spin-offs or like startup companies. You will see Animal Dynamics, for example, today. And there is interest. I mean, it was amazing how many people wanted to be here in the room. Uh, and that's why we do the webcast as well. And um, very important, what's in for you? I, I mentioned it before, it's basically to solve problems. If you have something to show, to showcase re research, and then of course to make this very important connections. I give you one example, um, and I'm nearly done. Um, is that is my main communication channel, the LinkedIn group. Who is using? Who has subscribed to this group, the LinkedIn group? 
Right. Very good. Thanks very much. Who has already written something on the grip? That's good. It's getting better. More people. This is my main communication channel. So I put all interesting grants and information there. I put all interesting uh, projects that I see and I would love to see you using that more. That is really important. A good example here from uh, Richard who's presenting later. I'm looking for someone for a job. That is something you should put in there. So it's your network, please. And I will, um, there's more to say, but I'm, I'm running out of time. I will have another slot after uh, for lunch and I will then mention this. So I want some actions from you and I will give you an outlook uh, of uh, what we do later. But now I want to introduce uh, Marc-Olivier Coppens. Uh, if you want to come here. He uh, uh, has built an amazing center uh, in the UCL. Uh, managed to get uh, good uh, uh, funding from EPSRC, yeah, but he will tell everything. Yes, Thank thanks very, very much. much. Do I need also a uh, No, you can the use this, this microphone. Works. So then I won't move. Or if you want <laughs> move to move, then you can have this one. Okay. Oh, no by the way, you can also clap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Monica. That's a great introduction. Also very excited to see the kickoff of this Nature Inspired Solutions um, KTN. And so what I'll do is just tell you a little bit about what Nature Inspired Engineering really is. And also, especially first, the, the why, uh, but then especially the how, the Nature Inspired Solutions for Engineering. How do we approach um, challenging problems by learning lessons from nature? And so that's something we've developed within the Center for Nature Inspired Engineering, the setup at UCL, which now has a lot of partners in academia and in uh, industry. And so at the end, I will say a little bit also about the, um, I'll give some examples and then say a little bit more about the structure of the center. So let's start first of why we um, go for these type of solutions. So there's a lot of grand challenges and they can be formulated in various ways. Um, you can think about the different academies, Royal Academy, U.S. National Academy and the Chinese, who formulated a number of grand challenges. The EPSRC, uh, in terms of UK prosperity goals or industrial strategy goals for the UK. And then also, apart from the economical, also the social context and the, um, um, the environmental context and UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, whatever way you want to look at these, clearly there are some immense challenges to be solved. And the problems are really clear and they're articulated again and again in different ways. But the question is, how do we really address them? We really need some transformative change to address these challenging problems. One of the things we need to do is to think out of the box, think in different ways. A lot of these challenges, they can only be solved in collaboration because they're really grand challenges. And for companies to survive and to actually thrive, uh, you need to have a competitive edge to be different, but also to understand the context of implementation, which may be different in different applications and different parts of the world. And also essential is really to cultivate uh, risk-taking and innovation, but also in a responsible way. And this responsible innovation is very much part also at UCL of one of these grand challenges. We have six, and since 2016, we had two extra ones beyond the first four. The grand challenge of transformative technology, which grew in one way out of the Center for Nature-Inspired Engineering that I lead. And so and that is co-chaired with Science and Technology Studies with John Agar. And there we try to look at how can we transform, how can we find solutions to grand challenges based on technology, but also within the context also of the humanities, the social sciences, the legal context, thinking about society and the planet. Now, as Monica said, I'm a chemical engineer. I'm the head of chemical engineering at UCL. And so I'm faced with this type of picture. We look at a so-called modern chemical plant and we compare it then with a, a, a a so-called metallurgical plant and chemical plant of the 16th century, and you see vessels in series. Yes, they may be made out of wood in those ages, and now they may be made perhaps out of steel, but with stirs in a very similar way. The question one can ask is, is there anything really fundamentally new? And so here, what we try to do is to ask ourselves, can we perhaps innovate by drawing lessons from nature? And the reasons for these are that when we look at nature around us with different eyes, we see an amazing architecture and dynamics and natural systems that are the basis, the foundation for desirable properties. 
Some are related to scalable architecture, the way that DNA is folded within the nucleus of a cell, or the way that cells are organized, molecules to cells, to organs, and also to organisms, and also the communication between these organisms. And so what you also see is that there is an optimization of transport across all these length scales, from the nano to the macro scale. And these are very much linked with reaction processes at the molecular and the nano scale. So you have what we call process intensification there, a very good scalable manufacturing type of uh, way that nature uses. Another thing we note is that a lot of processes occur far from equilibrium. In my discipline, as in many in engineering, we first see, tend to look at equilibrium, thermodynamics, the finite limits, but thermodynamics by itself and those limits are really mean depth. A lot of processes in nature, they occur intrinsically far from equilibrium. Think about how we breathe in and out, the pulsing of the blood, the firing of neurons, and so much more. These dynamics underlie resilience in systems, resilience in communication and in life itself, and are the basis also of adaptability. So you see the type of different properties that I underlined there are really related to the structure of nature in terms of architectural sense and in a dynamical sense. And this is how we came with a, um, what I call NICE, or nature-inspired chemical engineering, a methodology that have developed over the past 20 years or so, is learning from the architecture and dynamics of natural systems at multiple scales to help design and synthesize superior technological solutions for um, a number of problems related at the beginning resource efficiency and chemical manufacturing, but then went through the center for nature-inspired engineering to therapeutics, to living environment systems, novel functional materials, and so much more. Now, what is core in the Center for Nature Inspired Engineering is that we really look at fundamental mechanistic understanding. So no direct imitation from uh, nature, no biomimicry in a narrow sense. So there should also not be an imitation out of context. That is really key because the context of nature is very different than those of technology not even talking just purely about the social context and economical context, but think also about the access of materials we have, which may be very different from, say, where a particular plant tends to grow. Or think about the time scales, <clears throat> where nature may have a very long time, while we would like to have a solution in a much shorter time. So when we take things out of context, maybe we won't lead to the optimal solution. And who tells us that nature is out for the same solution that we are? But when we think about underlying mechanistic principles, like the ones I showed earlier, then we have a possibility to translate this when we adapt it to a technological environment and to a real product to be able to be really successful because there's clearly a lot to learn from nature. Think again <clears throat> as a chemical engineer and look now at a tree. A tree is like a chemical reactor. All the scales are important. Of course, the nanoscale for photosynthesis, the conversion of CO2 in the biomass that makes the tree grow, and the oxygen that's released. But what's also important is the mesoscale, the structure of the leaves, the venal architecture for nutrients to access where they need to go, water to go, and the macroscale, the growing crown of the tree, which grows in a self-similar way. It branches constantly in a way that the size of the twigs is the same in a young tree and in an old tree. So this is a continuous level of branching that's very different from the chemical reactors we use. However, there's clear parallel between the active sites and catalysts where molecules are transformed, the so-called catalyst pore networks, which is important for molecules to move through the catalyst and, and react on its surface, and the scale of the reactor, which is the tree, but very different from those reactors we saw earlier. Now, inspiration from tree has happened in many contexts. I mean, we think about Singapore, the Marina Bay Park, where you see this type of trees. However, is this truly inspiration from nature beyond the aesthetic? It's more like biosimilarity. It's more copying nature in a strict sense. It doesn't really use the principles of nature in this type of design. Very different, I think, from what Gaudí showed in the Sagrada Familia. This is more, there's a link, of course, also with aesthetic in terms of organic architecture, but there's more to it. He thought like an engineer. And so when you look at the columns in the Sagrada Familia, he was inspired by trees in a mechanical way, and he used all kinds of empirical models with different weights to be able to have these giant columns support the huge roof of that cathedral. And Gaudí made a very forward-looking statement already 100 years ago that the architect of the future will build imitating nature, for it's the most rational, long-lasting, and economical of methods. Now, these hierarchies of structures, we see them in all kinds of structures, in bones and in tendons, 
and they lead to multiple objectives, mechanical ones, transport of nutrients, the efficient use of materials, scalability, and so forth. Gustav Eiffel was inspired by the structure of the thigh bone, the femur, when constructing the Eiffel Tower. Indeed, the thigh bone is a very big bone, but it also needs to be light enough. It needs to be strong, but also light enough to carry us around. And he used the fact that there is a balancing of forces at multiple scale as an idea and as a methodology to design what was then the highest tower in Europe. So you can use much less material to achieve a very strong and robust structure. He didn't build a giant bone. He used principles from nature, mechanisms. That's key. Now, nature-inspired engineering, more broadly than just nature-inspired chemical engineering, is indeed this learning from nature to help design and synthesize solutions. But the question is, how do we do this? I talked about the why, but how do we do this? We really need a methodology to be able to go beyond one example and then move on to another example and another one. That is not a design methodology. And so that's how we developed in the center what I call nature-inspired solutions for engineering, or NICE. And I think when we look at nature, there's a vari variety of ways we can look at it, but there's two fundamental scientific ways to inspire scientific investigation. One is to look from a bi biological point of view and look at the remarkable features for uniqueness, the exceptional features, the rare ones, the concrete ones, like in the stardigrade, which can live at the bottom of the oceans, on the top of the mountains. You can freeze the liquid nitrogen and take it out, 30 years later it can still multiply, which is remarkable. So there's surely lots to be learned from this exceptional creature and by thinking about biology and the relation to materials. But another one is to look at universal features, the common one, the ubiquitous ones, which is more abstract. And that's often the territory of physics. We look at patterns on dunes, on beaches, altocumulus clouds. These are all regular patterns and they have a common foundation in terms of the physics that underlie this. Similar, when we look at the structure of the vascular network in a liver or the structure of a tree or of a lung or the vascular network around it, we see in each case an internal symmetry, which is called self-similarity and which Benoit Mandelbrot dubbed fractals. The fractal geometry of nature discusses this. It's a universal language to look at these hierarchical structures that look the same at multiple scales and it underlines desirable scalability problems. So, what nature inspired solutions for engineering as a methodology is, is it tends to be practical, to really solve challenging problems, to be enabling as a pathway to innovation, but also what we'll do is to be thematic, identifying universal principles as a basis to think about mechanisms that can leverage underpinning mechanisms like scalability to move from principles to applications. And key is that it is systematic, not ad hoc. And so we will use, and we do this in everything we do within the Center for Nature Inspired Engineering, <clears throat> we think about nature, we want to solve an application on the right, but we don't go in a straight way. We actually first try to derive an underlying concept, a nature inspired concept, that we implement in a design, and that we then realize in a prototype, and then you have an iterative cycle. So this is very much like product and process design. You have to go through various ways of scoping the possibilities to move to that application, and instead of going straight away, but doing this in a more fundamentally mechanistically based way, you can actually also be very versatile and translate solutions that you have validated to very different types of problems and kind of will illustrate this now. So this makes the approach very robust. So what are these themes and mechanisms we use? We can think about many, but initially we started with three and they've recently been extended to four. One is that there are very much hierarchical transport networks in nature. A second one relates to force balancing, but not only in mechanical sense, also at the nanoscale where you have electrical forces and polarization that play a role, for example, how chaperones help for protein or how aquaporins can channel water, but not salt. And then you have the dimension of time, the dynamic self-organization, like these patterns of sand on beaches, but also the self-organization, say, of bacterial communities that make them very robust and adaptable. And then a fourth one relates to ecosystems. We can draw a lot of ideas from ecosystems, their robustness, but also vulnerabilities. Think about the underlying networks and systems and modularity at multiple scales, from gene networks all the way to entire communities in rainforest. And so there's a lot to be learned from each of these principles when we uh, utilize them. So first one, in hierarchical transport networks. I'm a chemical engineer again, and so one of the problems is you have a number of chemicals, reactants you want to convert into products, there are reactions to do this, but you have to bridge many scales, from the nanoscale 
say, nanometers within pores all the way to reactors via catalysts. The problem is that there are transport issues of mole molecules. It's an infrastructure problem. How do the molecules get where they need to go and the products go out quickly enough and you have mole distribution problems? So think about our tree with its multiple scales, the hierarchical structure in it. We can use this by applying the structures of this tree in redesigning and rethinking fluidized beds, which is one type of reactor. It's a reactor where particles which need to be dried or coated, or there may be catalytic particles reacting with, uh, with gases. When we look at them, then we see that uh, when we have gas that is injected through the bottom, it puts these particles into motion and it looks like a boiling liquid above a certain velocity. So you have these big bubbles that appear, but they become bigger and bigger, and it's very difficult to scale these systems up. The hydrodynamics are complex. So while there's a lot of progress in characterizing and modeling these systems, the challenge is that uh, you show also a model distribution problem in a powder. The problem with all this is that the designs are highly empirical and the scale up is highly empirical. So we can look at nature, structures of trees or lungs, to design a fractal injector for these multi-phase reactors. And in a way, learning from nature to bridge length scales. So when we think about these fluidized beds, the concept is this fractal system where through one single inlet, you can distribute over many different outlets with equal path lengths to distribute fluid very uniformly, just like the nutrients would go to the tips of a tree or the air to the alveoli in the lung. And so you see a, a prototype there uh, made out of steel in this case, but now we could make it in uh, by uh, uh, additive manufacturing as well. So this, with changes in the manufacturing tools, you can make these things more easily. And so you see the concept here on the right that when you want to scale this up, instead of making everything bigger, you just change the number of generations and you keep the twig size, the outlet at the end, constant. Just like in the lung, like in the tree, like in the vascular network. So that is really a use. It's not an imitation of a cast of a lung. It is using the principles for the design for uniform distribution. And this can be applied in a lot of areas. And perhaps you've seen how I've moved from the structure of the lung through the concept of the fractal system to an actual design, to realize it. There you see an image where these bubbles are now very fine because the gas is intimately mixed with the local solid particles. And as a result, you get much higher conversions and selectivities towards desired products, so less waste uh, in the processes you want to scale up. So thinking about the tree again, we can also look at the mesoscale, so smaller scales, right? You can look at micrometers to millimeters in a sense. There, there are these catalysts that allow the reactions to occur. Molecules need to diffuse through the pores. This is not anymore flow driven by pressure differences. This is diffusion, the random motion of molecules. But there you have problems to, act, to access these active sites at the molecular level, at the nano level. And while there's a lot of progress in synthesis techniques to make all kinds of hierarchical structures with a well-controlled nanostructure, the question is, what is the optimal structure? And again, nature can come to the rescue here. When you do an overall optimization of these type of structures, mathematically, also using uh, methods of uh, computational optimization, you find very interestingly that the optimal structure would be a pellet, a larger particle consisting of smaller particles like cells, and in between them you have channels with an optimized size. What is key here is the size of these individual smaller particles, micro-level particles, and the size of the pores in between or the overall porosity. The distribution is much less important. And it tends to be a uniform solution, not a fractal one in this case. So when diffusion is important, you see these more uniform structures. And that is actually very similar to the structure of a leaf. Indeed, in a leaf, you see this transition from a fractal branching all the way to a very uniform structure, like you see, for example, in this Gunera leaf or on this poplar leaf. So this is a general rule. You go from fractal to uniform when the physics of transport move from flow to diffusion. So that's a very powerful concept. If you were just to imitate the structure of a leaf or of a lung, you wouldn't see this. You have to look at the mechanism, look also at the theory, do the simulations, and learn from that, and then implement it in a very different context, as you see, of design of new catalysts and reactors. Now, to show you how you can translate this to an entirely different field related to energy, think about fuel cells, right? Fuel cells convert chemical energy into electrical energy, and they do this in an electrocatalytic way, to circumvent the limits of the Carnot efficiency. And so the problem though is that fuel cells have been around for a long time, but catalysts are expensive in these PM fuel cells based on hydrogen, right? Reacting with oxygen catalytically. 
the platinum is expensive that's used there. There are mass transfer limitations, stability issues, water management issues. So we turn to the lung as a source of inspiration where you again have a transition from flow to diffusion and you go from a more fractal structure to a very uniform structure where in the alveola you have an exchange with the bloodstream. It's remarkable that this splits 14 to 16 levels of self-similarity until you get a very uniform structure, similar to what you see in the trees and uh, the leaves. And this is also done in a thermodynamically optimized way with an optimized length to diameter ratio and an optimized ratio of subsequent diameters in this branching. This is unbelievable. You can never prove this is why nature did it this way. But what you can see is you can look at physiological data, you can interpret them and say this is quite more than remarkable. It's scalable, it's efficient thermodynamically. It's just an amazing structure. Why not use it for fuel cells? Instead of distributing things through serpentine channels or interdigitated one, which have lead to very non-uniform use of the expensive catalyst, why not use this concept of a fractal plate, distribute the air on one side, distribute the fuel on the other side, and then have a catalyst layer where you have a very uniform distribution of the new materials we can now make for catalysis. And that's what we did. So we used this concept to design this fractal flow distributor. And so we did simulations where you see some results below. And what it means when you see this color becoming very uniform, it means that at a certain level of branching of this fractal structure, there diffusion starts to take over. You don't have limitations by the flow anymore. And you don't need more generations. Actually, they're not useful anymore. Just like in the tree, it stops at a certain branching level or in the lung. And so, beautifully, with X-ray microtomography, we can actually look through metal fuel plates and you see this fractal architecture and you can see if there's any blockages in there. So when we then compare different fuel cells with different types of fractal scaling, we see that the current densities with increased number of scaling levels up to a certain maximum increase dramatically by an order of magnitude. And this maximum is just there where flow goes to diffusion, like in the lung, like in the tree, like in the vascular network. And so this has been the basis for this design. So I've carried you through it here, and Malika, who will talk later, made the cover of this uh, journal article where we explained this type of nature-inspired engineering methodology and its application to fuel cells. So again, I don't have time to go into all the details of the lower row, but we did in a similar way. You see how we move from concept to design to realization, and you can do the same thing at the meso level in the catalyst. So, but then there is an issue, because the lung, it's not the same as a fuel cell. There's water that's produced, hydrogen and oxygen together from water. Water can condense. You can use neutron radiography to visualize water inside these plates. And you see there's some slugs and they may block the flow and the potential goes up and down. Again, nature can come to the rescue. We can look at this funny little creature, the thorny devil. The thorny devil walks into very dry deserts, but sometimes there's puddles of water. And when there's a puddle of water, thanks to capillary forces, the water goes along its skins, alongside these, um, uh, these, uh, these pins, and also tranks to both its physical, geometrical architecture and the different hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts. It goes all the way to its eye and I always think, you know, it's closing its eyes very happy and it can drink the water that comes to it. This is an example of passive water transport, very useful for water removal and management. And so you can do simulations to understand the structure to indeed show that this is the principle and then apply it machine structures to actually have basic liquid water removal. And so what you then see is that if you use this principle and design fuel cell plates in this way, you can spray a lot of water on it and it immediately kind of disappears. So you can manage the water flow and also have the benefits of the scalability and the low pressure drops you have together with water management. So I can't go into as much detail into the other examples. I wanted to show this one in more detail to see and show the approach. But we have these other mechanisms, and I'll move very quickly. Malika will talk later about nature spied coatings and how we learn from cicada wings and moth eyes to make coatings that are versatile and can also channel water, but also have interesting optical properties. We can use this at a nanoscale for catalysis, how chaperones, protein complexes, help to fold proteins in very small nano cavities. But they do this not just by nano confinement in a steric geometrical way, but by electrical force as well. And there's a very subtle balance. And so that can be used to design new materials, artificial materials, non-biological, based out of silica, the same component of sand, and make these nanostructured materials, put enzymes in there, and get an activity that's almost an order of magnitude higher 
than the free enzyme in solution, which may also explain why in very confined environments in the cells, proteins can be and enzymes may be very uh, active. However, when you propylate the serve, you make it hydrophilic, uh, hydrophobic, I'm sorry, then the activity collapses completely, as you see on the right. So again, it's the same methodology used at the nanoscale. Membranes, similar story. Think about how aquaporins work in a cell membrane. Get water through, but stop the salt. But it does this in a way that involves, again, polarization, electrostatics, not just geometrical confinement. All of these principles are important. You can learn this by doing molecular simulations to learn the mechanisms. These structures are very complicated. But then you can design simpler materials. They can be made out of inorganic platforms or using polymers and use those principles, embed them to design much more effective uh, uh, membranes, right? So we're, doing, we're also looking at kidneys, again, uh, in our group at this moment, because they have to last a lifetime and also they don't foul. A big problem in membrane design and in separations that the, there's a fouling it's a, the, the, and then you can't use the membrane anymore. And the kidneys don't do this. So what can we learn from these principles? So a third principle is dynamic self-organization where you have these pattern formation. You see them on dunes, on beaches, on outer cumulus clouds, even on a cup of tea when you look and vibrate it, right? And so these patterns, they occur due to continuous perturbation. So there's a continuous energy inflow, the wind or the waves. And so when you vibrate particles on a plate, physicists have already demonstrated a long time ago that you can form by nonlinear interactions through the interactions with the, the air of these particles, but also due to friction, very regular patterns. Now, we implemented it with our beloved fluidized bed I showed you earlier. But now, instead of an injector, we oscillate the gas flow. And you see how you go and go from a chaotic flow to very nice periodic flow by just oscillating the gas flow, similar to what you see in these ripples in the sand. And in 3D, so you see system in 2D, that's the one on the left. And then in 3D, you see these beautiful patterns. Um, they're quite mesmerizing. This with a high-speed camera slow down that you see what I call Belgian waffle patterns because I'm originally from Belgium. <laughs> and so, and you see how you can get a square pattern within a circular environment. So very interesting way of using dynamics, learning from nature for scale up, right? Same principles, concept, derive a concept, use the design with this oscillating with different valves, realize it experimentally, implement it. Right? So dynamic self-organization clearly is even more complex and very interesting in this context of infrastructure and resilience of infrastructure. When you look at bacterial communities or flamingos or fishbowls, the self-organization is just fascinating. It's beautiful, but it's important for life. And so we can learn from this by simplifying this and using agent-based system simulations to think about how out of simple agents, by communications, diffusion, which, which basic properties are essential to lead to a desired, complex, emergent, collective behavior. And simply changing the kinetics of how, say, bacteria or these agents interact with their environment leads to completely different shapes, as you see below. And so this can be the basis for adaptive materials and systems. So moving on to the fourth one, the first three we were working on and continue to work on and validate it when receiving this Frontier Engineering Award in 2013 with this five million pound support from EPSRC. And now, thanks to a new progression award that we received this year, we can start working on this fourth theme that very much links to the theme of the Nature Inspired Solution KTN, linking about ecosystems, networks, and modularity. I'll give you just one example here, the Svalbard reindeer. The Svalbard reindeer lives in the Arctic, 80 degrees north. Unbelievable, so I went up there, and so you notice that it has a very thick throat. What you also notice, where well, you can't notice on the picture, but when it breathes in and out, you can't see the vapor condensing, which happens when we breathe in and out in, on a cold winter day. And so what happens is that the water is actually captured within an internal structure, within its snout. And so when it breathes in, it gets some of the water out of this dry Arctic air and condenses it, and it conserves it. And so in this way, you can have 20, 25% of its water needs, even in the dry Arctic air, out of the water. Why would it do it? Because otherwise it needs to eat the ice. And the latent heat of ice to, to melt it is very, very high. So it consumes a lot of energy, which it of course needs because it's cold, right? So can we derive from all that? I mean, there's also other things like tr trigger-induced brain cooling. It doesn't have natural predators. So it doesn't move around very much. It's very quiet in the winter, right? And so, but at some moment there's a shunting mechanism it leads the blood flow to accelerate to the, to the brain and it puts like a fan on a computer, puts it back in motion, 
So basically, can we learn from these control mechanisms, the water integration, heat integration, using this mechanistic methodology to design new solutions for uh, different systems, whether it is from fuel cells, batteries, resilient infrastructure, and more. Right. We, we involving this also in the biomedical sphere. I won't talk about this in cancer therapy with a colleague Richard Day in medicine and his common student Matthew Chin, biomedical uh, engineer by training, is moving away from a more reductionist thinking about cancer therapy to a more systems way thinking because a lot of things influence how cancer cells develop, including their environment. And it's not just a pure simply looking at one gene or one molecule. And so perhaps we can learn something by working at that edge of chaos. So I've tried to show you is that NICE can be used as a general methodology for innovation and design. I've shown you, I hope, that it's practical, enabling, and also it's important to be mechanistic and thematic so it doesn't become ad hoc. You see one creature, you get an idea, you move on to something else, and you wonder, how do I get another idea now? Right? So it, in this way, it becomes robust, versatile, and a way to address many problems, perhaps, you are thinking about. And so this methodology that I've tried to illustrate, we've developed it further within the Center for Nature Inspired Engineering, with these objectives, and one of the important objectives is translating research findings into practice, and I hope this network will help us to do this further. This is to engage with industry, but also a lot of entrepreneurship we see in the center. I mean, it's something I haven't uh, discussed today. So while I'm the director of the center, we have a strategic alliance manager, Robin Rampel, who is here with us today, and uh, you can meet later, as, as Claire, there's Jane Butler, of Vice Dean of Engineering. And there's different strands led by different people from different disciplines. And as you see, focusing on different application areas led by different leads. And so we have people from all these disciplines working together because none of this, as I illustrated, even with the fuel cell or the medical problem or problems in architecture, the built environment can be solved by one discipline. It's really important to merge them with the domain expertise you have from all these areas together. And of course, we have an external advisory group. There's my own group. I call it the smiling nice group. They're really nice, but also working hard and working together, coming from architecture to medicine to physics to chemical engineering, working together with many visitors from around the world. To extend the, the, the center, I don't want to give you the impression it's only at UCL. So we have initiated these inspiration grants from the start. And so around 2015, we started giving these grants of a few months of pump priming research of new researchers within UCL to always collaborate with another researcher who is not at UCL from another university and also with uh, industry. And so I won't go over all these, but you see the variety of topics from bioactive aerogels to 3D printing underwater to the self-organizing built environment. So this has led to 20 awards between 2015 and 2019. We've distributed as a basis as part of these five million pounds core money. And it's led to hundreds of partnerships in this way and extending over the UK and internationally. And you see how broad again this, this goes. So this was until 2019, until now. Uh, um, also, there's been tremendous investment in labs, in equipment, more than 10 million pounds, thanks to also UCL and UCL Engineering, a fantastic research lab managers and senior research technicians in our labs, but also new funds from EPSRC and collaboration with instrument manufacturers, including in the UK itself, right? And so how can we develop the best instruments together and test these? And so it also has led to new collaborations uh, as well. There's been industrial engagement and support, as Monica has already mentioned, across many types of industries, from big chemical industries to startups in energy, in architecture, and, uh, and of course, support from the EPSRC. We engage in outreach and engagement. Actually, after this event, uh, I'm speaking at, our, uh, at UCL for our Nature's Path Chemical Engineering Summer Challenge, where we have high school students from underrepresented groups and from um, 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 you know, underprivileged backgrounds who come and spend some weeks in our laboratories and learn about engineering and about the lessons we can learn from nature. And so I'll, I'll discuss with them uh, later tonight. And we have Into Science Project, many, many things. Mark Mildovnik is part of it. Many of you might know him uh, as well, who is part also of our, of our center. We teach a course. I've taught a course on nature's path chemical engineering, and we now translating to move this to solutions for engineering. So this has quite a bit of success in chemical engineering and helps for students in groups, not to just get lectures, 
but they are fascinated by a particular problem they want to solve and they try to solve it over the course of a term. And they keep amazing us of how they think about, say, learning lessons from the, the, the camel uh, uh, and its cooling of its brain for new process systems engineering, or things about ways of anti-fouling, uh, thinking about uh, the antibacterial properties of, of wings. Okay, so there's lots of this. And so now we are setting up a training program that will move to MSc and PhD, starting with the nature inspired solutions for engineering methodology, but then using, again, design expertise across disciplines because our challenges are really cross-disciplinary and this is really uh, essential in this so it's very collaborative i'm fortunate enough that at ucl we have this very collaborative spirit but also the many interactions with industry which leads to internships also entrepreneurship of students which we like to encourage so to finish here i want to say we have uh, we have special issues of journals like on nature's path chemical engineering chemical engineering research and design but importantly a conference that's coming up beginning of September and there are flyers that were uh, uh, put everywhere by Robin earlier and where Monica will also be involved. Um, so this will be in southern Italy and so it will attract uh, keynote speakers from a variety of areas from architecture to uh, chemical and mechanical uh, engineering and robotics to explore the methodology of nature inspired engineering but also to have debates and discussions between academics and industry and also to show by a workshop of how you can use this methodology to solve problems. So perhaps it might interest you and we hope uh, to see you there between the 8th and the 13th of September. So here I would like to conclude and thank you. I, um, I hope I give you a bit of an introduction of the methodology, the how, the why, and how we take this approach. And I look forward to a very amazing, exciting uh, start here and a flourishing, blossoming of the KTN under Monica's leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really thrilled. That was really fascinating. And uh, I'm also glad to say that Marc Olivier will be, will be with us the whole day, including the workshop, knowing his busy schedule. So you can ask him questions afterwards. Thanks very much Pleasure. for this inspiring uh, talk. <laughs> so I see there are some people standing in the back. There are some more chairs here. If you want to move to the front, we have a... Uh, some space here uh, and also um, before I start introducing the, the showcase presentations I want to mention uh, that for um, environmental and organizational reasons I didn't print out uh, the kind of brochure that we have so uh, you got that uh, when um, the joining instructions were sent out so basically this is a description of all the showcases that you can see afterwards um, also, obviously, the agenda is uh, on the table. And on coming in, you saw the list of delegates in the room. And uh, I hear that we have a good um, 65 people on the webcast. So great, thanks for joining uh, as well. So uh, I want to introduce Malika now. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, you want to use um, like this or stand here? I think or? it's better with that. Yeah. Um, just saying that, you know, if you want to go to space, probably you shouldn't. Ideally, okay. Ideally stand here. So just saying, sorry, Monica. Uh, when you want to go to space, you wouldn't want to bring water because it's really heavy. Exactly. And Malika has a solution for that. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm in Mark Olivi Coppens group, and I would like to introduce you to nature inspired multifunctional surface coatings for space flight. In space, there are difficulties because conditions in space are extreme. Nevertheless, the environmental health control system um, has to be the same as on Earth, so it has to provide comfort and a healthy quality of life. The difficulty here is that the um, yeah, that the um, that is difficult to control the system. So the su life support system uh, controls, for example, the humidity. The humidity range should be between 40 and 60 percent for normal um, the built environment, but also for the space, because otherwise there are difficulties such as direct and indirect health issues, such as asthma and respiratory issues. But in addition, the growth of in bacteria can influence the the um, 
the space massively. So what they do in the space station, they reclaim the water uh, that is produced by astronauts breathing, sweating and washing. They reclaim this by um, purifying the water coming from the cabin air. They condense it, they um, put it together and then they can reuse it again. However, only 70 to 93% is reusable, which means that 6,000 to 9,000 liters of water have to be brought from Earth to space every single year. This means it's extremely expensive. It costs between 16 and 71 million dollars and is increasing if we go to Moon in 2024, to Mars and beyond. So otherwise, there are also issues because in, the, um, in one of the EVAs, the one astronaut drown almost drowned by having 1.3 liters of water in his helmet. And additionally, um, there were issues with the water bubbles that shut down oxygen systems. Up to date, there's no um, proper solution for a clo closed loop system and new approaches have to be found. What we do in Nature Inspired Chemical Engineering, as you've heard before, we look into nature to find solutions for this. So our idea is to use the inspiration from cicada wings, human and moth eyes to properly introduce that topic. These um, cicada wings, moth and human eyes have the microstructures which um, have different functions. So, so they are in the micro scale and they have, for example, for cicada wings, they're super hydrophobic, meaning they repel water. In addition to that, moth and human eyes have these cone shapes that are absorbing and focusing the light. So what we thought to do is create a multifunctional surface that um, can do everything. So that can be super hydrophobic, can repel water and maybe can include the light aspect as well. We fabricated that by two photon polymerization, which is basically 3D nanoprinting. Uh, it uses a strong laser that crosslinks the structures uh, with the um, liquid photoresist, and then it has to be cured as well. This is how it looks like in comparison to a five pence coin. It is very interesting because you can see that they're only between 100 and 1000 microns in height. Um, so you can see how really they are inspired by this little tiny wings of the cicada wings. So we've done uh, some tests already, meaning the water droplets staying on top first and then they sink in after a while and um, by capillary action and um, this is a very interesting method. So what we do with this, we want to uh, get into potential applications for space because the International Space Station, future spacecraft and habitats on Moon and Mars need, as we've heard before, uh, to reclaim the water efficiently. So what we can do with our system, we could produce a passive system which is in properly put on top of the ventilations so that in, there is no need for any energy. Additionally to that, the capillary action that works in space is, is greater than on Earth because there is no gravity. Additionally to that, it can be used for other functional materials because the ionizing radiation is a, is a bad issue. So we um, have hopefully a an, an benefit for, for radiation as well, but also cicada wings repel bacteria. So um, we hope to increase that function as well. But also in future, we can think about the built environment and hope to increase that as well. So other ideas could be to include it as a surface coating on a wall or on a window. Thank you very much. Malika, thanks very much. It's a spe spe special challenge to have a nanoscale um, demonstrator. So that would be very, um, she has really good photos though. And now uh, we have Andy from University of Sussex who will sorry, I'm talk about uh, what you can learn from ants and bees. Yeah, so um, thanks very much for inviting me. So um, I'm hopefully going to persuade you that um, we can learn a lot for, uh, for AI and robotics by trying to understand how um, small brains, um, albeit small brains that have been honed by evolution to do particular tasks, can complete those tasks. Um, and uh, say so this is part of the uh, Brains on Board project, which is uh, a programme grant funded by EPSRC. It's a collaboration between Sheffield University, ourselves and Queen Mary. 
Um, and we're a mix of uh, computer scientists, computational neuroscience and, and biologists. So we've got small scale and large scale um, B experiments along with a lot of modeling. And I think it's important because I think that we kind of do AI and say in its original definition where we want to understand a system and then be inspired by that system. I think it's very important. And to, um, I loved what uh, uh, Mark said, but we, we need to, um, we take a kind of artificial life perspective where um, you want to look at the situated embodied animal. To understand how something does something, you want to look at it in its natural environment, acting in its natural environment. And maybe take a task specific view of how it, it does things. So I'll come a little bit to this. Um, but you know, the motivation is, is that we, we need to build better robots, right? These are amazing feats of engineering, that's without doubt. Um, but um, there are issues, um, and again, thanks to Mark, particularly in robustness, in speed of learning, a lot of these things to do with materials. And it's a bit of a cheek, so I'm showing these are the DARPA fails. But I think it highlights our kind of anthropocentric view, right? Why would you possibly try and build legged robots when you could be inspired by, by bees and their fantastic robustness? So bees need to forage, um, they forage kilometres every day, and they go from the first time they leave the nest they go a few kilometres, come back, and learn that robustly and come back. So um, we want to be inspired by this and to um, uh, mimic their learning abilities, mimic their brains. Here I'm showing ants because we study all the hymenoptera, so bees, wasps and ants. Um, we're going to focus on navigation because they're foraging specialists. They, um, they learn and navigate very quickly despite sort of tiny brains, which are optimised for learning and navigation. Um, we can see one doing a specialist behaviour here where she's scanning in multiple directions. Um, so to focus on the ants, if it will move on. Oh, sorry. Uh, a second. Yeah. So ants, this is the desert ant habitat. Um, lots of scrub, lots of bits of tussocks that all look very similar, right? And their sort of day in the life of the ant is they wander out randomly by passing to earn, um, find a dead insect that's died in the heat, and then they come back um, having accumulated their steps through path integration, sort of a dormitory, and come back roughly to the nest, right? Now, path integration is prone to cumulative errors. So on this one trip back, they will learn the visual information they later need to recapitulate that route. And they can do this learning in a single trial, right? Um, the key point here, it's very, very hot. So they have to do this very quickly. There are no pheromones, everything burns off. And they do it with a brain that's half a million neurons and a vision that's equivalent of about a kilobyte pixel, a kilopixel really. So how do they do this? Well, they don't, they use low resolution vision. They learn, it appears, they learn the appearance of the world and not features. They learn what they should do and not what they are. They don't try and work out where they are in a map based thing. They work out, they use vision to recall the action they should take. And I can talk to people more about this. Um, and so inspired by this, um, we have developed an algorithm that's able to navigate complex -ish routes um, so you can see um, on the left is the training route. So we give the, the robot one training route. Um, we use the images to then use these images to train a neural network. Because of this action-based uh, way, this action sort of specific way we do it, we can learn it to train. We train for recognition, not familiarity, which is a simple problem. And then the robot, with all computation on board, this little um, Jetson is able to navigate the route in a certain way. It's not distracted by people because if we look at what it's actually seeing, um, this is a panoramic view. You can see that all the information is in the horizon. People kind of disappear. If you stop focusing um, on us, if you don't take an anthropocentric view, people just disappear from the view. Um, and we can do this in multiple different modalities, looking down, even with tactile robot, ro uh, in a tactile space for an app-based navigation. Um, but our focus is currently to put it onto a drone uh, because you, know, you get these very efficient solutions from insects and it means they're very lightweight so we can put them on drones and hopefully navigate with them. So please come and find out some more later. Thanks Andy. So next up we have Jonathan from Animal Dynamics. Um, so the view, as I mentioned on my slide earlier, from a, from a company, and he will tell us more now. Thanks, Monica. Uh, 
Yeah, so my name is Johnny. I'm an engineer slash researcher at Animal Dynamics, and so I'm here today to tell you a bit about what we do. Um, so we're an Oxford-based company. Um, we were founded in 2015 um, by as a spin-out from the Oxford uh, University of Oxford Department of Zoology. Um, yeah, 2015, so four years of work now. We're founded on the idea that animals are efficient movers. So animals are constantly trying to save energy um, when it comes to locomotion, so they can spend that energy doing the more important things in life, like feeding or you know, making sure your genetics get passed on to the next generation. So if we can apply these principles, these biomechanics, to designing, well, you know, if we can learn how animals do this, we can design hyper-efficient systems um, sort of for flight and for aquatic motion. Um, but we also understand that animals aren't purely locomotion machines. So you know, they do other things like eating, like reproducing, like competing with each other. And so we have to learn what part of an animal is important for locomotion and efficiency and what parts of animals aren't important for that. So we, take, so we keep the important stuff, the efficient stuff, and eliminate the non-efficient stuff. We also understand that there are mechanisms in nature which aren't, which, no, mechanisms in engineering which aren't found in nature. So things like propellers and wheels, these rotary systems aren't found anywhere in nature, but it's pretty hard to argue that they aren't effective mechanisms of propulsion. And this could be because you know, nerves and, and blood vessels don't do well when it comes to rotary motion, they get tangled up, um, but we have to take the best parts of nature, the efficient parts of nature, the effective parts of engineering, and combine them to make our systems. So we have four systems, uh, three systems, sorry, in animal dynamics. So firstly, and the most developed of which is Stork, this autonomous um, long-range payload delivery system. So it can carry you know, large payloads for long distances, for useful for military aid or humanitarian aid. Um, takes a lot of knowledge from the power paraglider scene, uh, but also is controlled through mechanisms which are found in nature. So, for example, gliding or thermal soaring, which you see in a lot of birds of prey. Secondly, we have Skeeter, um, which is our dragonfly-inspired drone. So instead, in place of four rotors, which you see in commercial quadcopters, we have four flexible flapping wings. Um, this can be equipped with a small camera, so it could be used for search and rescue missions or for surveillance. Um, and we're currently working on driving that through to um, our further stage development. And finally, we have Malolo. So this is our only... Um, non-autonomous system, so it's a fully manned um, water bike, but in place of a propeller, which you might normally find on a water bike, we have a dolphin or um, whale fluke on the tail. So this can drive movements more effectively um, and with a reduced noise profile, as you would normally find on a propeller. So we could hopefully translate this into larger vehicles in the future. So as I mentioned, Stork is our most developed system, so I'm just going to play a quick video of what it can do. So power up and it can quickly take off over a very short runway. This is carrying 15 kilos. Um, so even after a very short distance, it can take off and quickly gain altitude. This is controlled entirely um, autonomously. Well, not, it can be, can be controlled entirely autonomously. This is controlled remotely from a pilot, um, but you can program in different waypoints to the, to the autopilot and the vehicle will then find the most efficient route between those, between those waypoints. Um, and you can also issue instructions at those waypoints as well. For example, we can deliver a payload via parachute, which we'll hopefully do in a few seconds. It's good timing. Um, so that can be used for delivering payloads to really remote locations where landing might, uh, might not otherwise be possible. Um, unfortunately, for reasons of security and IP, we can't yet show you a video of Skeeter flying, but this is a lovely video of what it, we hope it's going to look like um, very soon. So flying through really complex environments, um, coping with gusts really well and having a much reduced noise profile compared to commercial um, solutions which have noisy um, rotors which don't cope well in turbulent conditions. Uh, but taking that to the next step is where we hope you come in. Uh, so we're hoping to learn from your experience and you learn from us in terms of how best to take our product from the biological through to the mechanical. So what materials can we use? What, what can we do for, for the wings, for the body? Um, what mechanisms can we use to drive those wings? You know, how is it best to control them? Do we use amplitude control, frequency, angle of attack, you know, or a combination of all three? How do we best control those wings to give us the best maneuverability? And finally, are there better control algorithms we can use, for example, gust tolerance and bio-inspired control for navigation? Um, we're having to learn from your experience and you can learn from our experience, so please do come and see us later on. Thank you. Can I have whoop, Bola, Can I have Netta next? Thanks very much. Uh, she came to us from the University of Leeds. 
and uh, looks at very small worms, but she will tell everything about that. Great. So, um, thanks for inviting me. Somebody forgot a piece of paper here. Um, so, um, we're going to look at worms that uh, taste their way in order to find food and ask whether we can apply the principles, the navigational principles, the sensory motor coupling principles of these tiny little animals um, to robotics. And this is part of a vision of zero street works by 2050. So imagine driving down a city and there isn't a closed road right in front of you. And you haven't just bumped into a pothole. And the lights are actually working. And everything's actually working. Isn't that an unbelievable vision? Well, um, if you think about what it would take to realize that vision, you'll probably say, oh, we're going to have these swarms of tiny little robots all over our cities, and they're going to fix everything. They're going to detect the little cracks before they become potholes, and they're going to fix those little cracks before they become dangerous, before just they're going to uh, spot those things just as the water is beginning to seep in and grow those cracks. And isn't that going to be absolutely wonderful? But it's not that easy. And the reason it's not that easy is because taking robots from the well-controlled environment of the lab and of the manufacturing scenario and into the rough terrain of the city is not easy. Getting robots to work in different weather conditions, getting robots to see the road in front of them, no matter what the weather conditions, um, is not an easy problem. Getting robots to navigate environments where they're not being told, oh, look, it's a meter by a meter squared, is not that easy. So where did the worm go? Here it is. OK, so it's a millimeter big. It is so, so tiny that there's no space for a brain. So it only has about 300 brain cells in it. Um, and it has to nonetheless survive. It's a free living organism, so it needs all the functions that a normal organism needs to survive. It needs to find food, it needs to avoid danger, it needs to avoid predation, it needs to lay eggs, it has rudimentary social behavior, it has learning, it has memory. Um, it can even solve a maze, we're told, in the last few weeks. Um, and so, how does it do that? And we're going to focus on its foraging strategy. And um, so here is a computer model of how the worm tastes its way. So the worm has no vision system. It only tastes its way as it's moving through the ground. And based on the chemical cues that it's tasting, it decides whether the direction it's going in is a good direction or a bad direction. If it's a good direction, I should go forward. If it's a bad direction, I should turn. And if you simulate the actual sensory computation and the actual motor control of this animal, whoops, does it work? trying to find, ah, here we go. Okay, so this is a simulation of how um, the, is it not working? Uh, this is a simulation of how the worm is navigating these different chemical gradients in order to try and find the more favorable ones. And it's sort of doing a balance of exploration of exploitation. It's looking up the gradient and if it's finding food, great. And if it's not finding food, it goes away. And this balance of exploration and exploitation allows it to scan very large areas very effectively. And if we put that mechanism into a robot, and we can ask, does this robot now find cracks? We want it to, uh, we want it to do the same things that a worm does, but very cheaply. So this robot parts is less than 50 pounds, um, and it, in this case, navigates uh, 20 square meters of area and finding these cracks there, every time it finds a crack, it geotags it and classifies it. Um, it's undulating just like a little robot. Uh, it goes back and forth and explores these areas. When it's unsure, it slows down. When it's very sure, and all every, the entire system is basically this computational model that I've showed you, basically copied over with a camera stuck in front. Um, and so in this case, it's finding all the six cracks of this system uh, this is roughly uh, uh, 17 minutes of video. You can see the actual robot downstairs. I'm going to skip the end of 
uh, this so I can uh, show you that we can train the system not to uh, spot certain things. So we train it not to spot the yellow lines or areas that uh, have recently been fixed. Uh, this is, uh, the blue line is the worm bot and all the other lines are all the other systems we've tried to test and benchmark it against. It outperforms every single system we've tried so far. The example on the left is simulations on a kilometer road and the example on the right is actual roads tested all around Leeds. Um, advantages of the system, the area doesn't need to be characterized, there's no map of the system, you just take it, you drop it, it moves. Um, the vision system can be trained for day vision, night vision, in this case it's night vision, it can do crack finding but you can train it to find rubbish, you can train it to do anything you want so long as uh, the machine, uh, uh, the camera can actually spot those things. And, <laughs> and this is uh, an example of uh, Example on the left of deer attacking five kilometers of roads around Leeds, and on the right, a test of the control mechanism for actually repairing the crack. Great. I'll leave it there. <laughs> People will be thrilled to see everybody, everything downstairs in the showcases. I know five minutes is cool, but thanks for everybody <laughs> sticking to time. So next up is um, the uh, furthest participant, Ruben, from uh, Harriet Watt University also furthest in the room, <laughs> so um, I want to use the opportunity to say um, um, hello to his uh, boss, Marc Demelier, who is a leading figure in um, nature-inspired work in uh, Harriet Watt in Scotland. And uh, I don't know, Julian, uh, yes, here you are. He will um, showcase uh, together with um, a Ruben downstairs, also one of sort of the uh, how does it forefathers of, of nature inspired uh, work in the UK? Really thrilled to have you, Julian. So we have to move you on. Sorry. Quickly. Okay, so where are we? Yeah. Yep. Hi, everyone. Can you stick to the microphone, please? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ruben Krauper. Um, I'm a PhD student in computer science at Harry Watt University, working together with Julian. Um, and we're working on computer-aided biomimetics. So the process that Mark uh, Olivier Coppens uh, described, having a biological model and going to a concept, we're trying to solve where do you find the biological model. Uh, because as an engineer, you're probably not trained in biology. Um, so if you look at a classic kind of engineering process, a design process, and you compare that against a biomimetic problem-solving process, there's going to be a part that's happening in the biological domain. And as an engineer, that's where you would like to have some support. Um, so as an example, um, say you have a steerable needle or endoscope that you want to insert into human bodies. Um, you could think about like defining that as a, as a flexible needle, but that doesn't look very pleasant. Uh, and it also wouldn't allow you to do, for example, brain surgery. Um, a biological model that could be used is the wood wasp. Um, that's actually a wasp that has a very long needle that it inserts into wood. Um, because the needle uh, fixes itself into the wood and has multiple parts moving itself into the, into the material, the substrate, and can also bend around corners. Uh, so that research is actually being done now at Imperial, Imperial uh, here in London. Um, but to find that wood wasp, to find such a very specific example of biological information. As an engineer, you have to know where to find the information. Uh, if you're getting a bunch of results, you have to know on which information sources you're actually going to be spending time. And then you also have to start uh, understanding that information, knowing which parts of it are relevant to your problem. Um, so here again, the pre-commercial system for the, the wood wasp um, needle steering technology. A recent paper, they're doing cadaver trials, so they're pretty far. It's attached to a robot arm. And here you can see the movable parts exactly as uh, it was inspired by the wood wasp. Uh, so coming back to computational systems, um, would you want to have a database to help engineers search for biological information? And on the one hand, yes, because it's easy to search. You can easily define in the database the information in a way that it's uh, accessible to engineers. Uh, but it's inherently limited in scope and it can take days, for example, to create one example for the database by a biologist so that an engineer can actually access it. 
so we're trying it the other way, where you have theoretically unlimited search through biological text, but it's obviously harder for an engineer to just understand biological papers. Um, to that end, we use uh, uh, a concept called trade-offs, which is uh, commonly used in evolutionary biology uh, to de define where uh, a system is working between two, two boundaries, where one trait cannot increase without the decrease of another. For example, you cannot be very fast and super accurate, so speed and accuracy is a common trade-off. Um, those trade-offs are within domain terminology, so we can search for them in text. And they provide a high level of abstraction uh, for domain transfer between engineering and biology. Um, and our aim is also to visualize the concepts that occur in that text. Uh, so if you look at the wood wasp, you could uh, define that as a trade-off between force that it has to like, apply onto the substrate uh, and also the lightness of the wasp itself to, to be able to fly. Um, and then if the needle itself can drill uh, into the wood, then you can have a zero net external force. So actually the, the wood wasp itself doesn't have to apply that force and can still be light. Um, so how that process actually works and some of our computational systems we have downstairs running. So hope to see you at our showcase. Thank you. Thank you. So next up we have uh, Christopher from University of London. Uh, he kindly agreed, although he's an expert uh, on um, aeronautical engineering, to also talk about uh, applications for marine and wind energy. And I think that also shows the point that is, um, you know, the translation to various sectors is really important. As we have heard before, is a lot of uh, interdisciplinary work that will be needed to get really good solutions. Thanks very much and welcome. Thanks also for being invited here. So the, the good thing is I got a research chair from the Royal Academy of Engineering on nature inspired flow sensing and flow manipulation. So that gave me a little bit support on the financial side, but it's also my position is sponsored by, by uh, BIE Systems. So the vision is, and this is ex uh, exactly following um, um, your talk, yeah, um, not to copy, but to be inspired by the physical mechanism of the um, underlying principle yeah, and so we have in nature, which is one important thing, always flexibility involved in all structures. So it's clear that we have to approach a flexible aerodynamic surface in future or surfaces also for wind turbines and underwater marines just not only just to, to have the potential to move or to, to, to change your shape, but also for hydroacoustics all this, you know, or aeroacoustics aspects and so on. That's what we do and research. So you see some nice images here, <coughs> the pop-up feathers of birds, scales, we know that they are flexible, they have uh, optical properties, but also what we showed later is also their, their properties for uh, manipulating the near ball flow. And an interesting thing is also the sensory system. Look at the crash of the Max, uh, the Boeing Max, for example, just we depend in an airplane on two sensors. That was also the crash of the uh, Airbus in, uh, in the storm some 20 years ago on two PITO sensors. So in nature, we have thousand sensors which have a redundant system. And this is shown here, these small wind hairs, hairs on bat wings. And this is what we did. We cop not copied that. We took the fundamental principle of such a sensor, which you see here, for a wall shear stress sensor in fluid mechanics. It was a lack on wall shear stress measurements. There is no method which can do that. And we built up tiny flexible hairs, which you can see here. Uh, so I'm not able to play that. Just click on the image. I don't see the mouse. Actually. So these hairs are about uh, 500 microns tall. Yeah, diameter is about 20 and flexible made from PDMS and you have a first image of the topology of the wall shear stress field in a turbulent flow and very nicely we could discover the first reverse flow events in turbulent flows which are linked with strong um, uh, strong transfer of heat heat and uh, 
yeah, especially heat transfer in these local areas. Another thing, pop-up feathers. So we developed, based on research on a peregrine falcon stoop, which is the fastest animal in the world, some ideas, what, how do we can sense the angle of incidence? And exactly this is something which uh, Boeing tried with their MAX system and they crashed, they failed. And we know from nature, they have a very sensitive angle of uh, incidence sensor. And these, what we discovered was just the vibrational sense and the cells which sense the vibrations of the secondary feathers which are in a region where the incipient flow separation would start. So it's a very nice idea to place the sensors exactly where the first indication of this, uh, let me say, separation will start off. You will see some models down in the, in the showcase. Another thing, flexible structures, again, to avoid flow separation. So very simple idea. Now we go to in practical situations. On the left, you see this, this uh, airfoil with flexible elements. We know now the physical principle what these flexible elements can do. They avoid the uh, transition to nonlinear behavior of the boundary layer, so they keep the flow attached. This is what we also then developed later on. If we use these flexible structures, we can damp out air acoustic noise. So we can avoid, for example, these high noise peaks uh, of the landing gears on, on bluff structures. So you see a cylinder attached with flexible flaps in the aft part. If you do this simple thing and you know how to tune the, the physical properties of the attached flaps to the eigenfrequency of the system, then you get the best effect of that. So it's not just copying, tuning and tailoring these flexible structures to the fundamental instabilities in the flow. So, and then <coughs> finally back, the nice thing is also we got a, a movie in the BBC Two series because of the research of our structure or what we do with the Peregrine Falcon. You will see some models there and lots of other things what we did there also already in cooperation with some companies. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Does it work? Yeah. Good. Are we, um, are we good to go with the webcast as well? Thanks for being back into the room. I hope you had an opportunity to look at the showcases. I think they're pretty amazing. I didn't have an opportunity, so I hope at the very end I will have. It's great to see so many interesting people in the room and you know, meet the people that you have emailed or phoned you know, face to face. It's really, really exciting for me today. So we just want um, to welcome again the people in the webcast and uh, we want to be sure that everything runs smoothly again so I do, do a bit of filling. So uh, <laughs> what, what is uh, the most exciting things you have seen so far in the showcases? Any volunteers? <coughs> You're smiling, that's a good sign. <laughs> The flight? The, the last talk? Yeah, that was really interesting, yeah, indeed. I think everything is really interesting. And also, the, the, as, as Marc Olivier mentioned, it's really cross-cutting. So we have robotics people, you know, people looking at biomechanics, uh, chemical engineers. And I think that's the key, really, that we try to work together and bring the people together. And as, as uh, Marc Olivier is saying, he's done at UCL. And I think uh, the network should be a way to bring people together. So I think um, okay. we're we all good to go. Uh, so if I can ask um, Gillian to come here, uh, she comes from us from base, to talk about the bioeconomy strategy and how it um, will... Um, yes, so you can just move that forward here. Brilliant. Thank you, Monica. So, hi. Uh, I'm glad I got the post coffee slot, so hopefully you're all well caffeinated now. <laughs> Excited for the bioeconomy. Uh, I am Gillian Whitworth. I'm a policy advisor in the bioeconomy and plastics team at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. 
So I've been asked to speak today a bit more widely on the links between the UK bioeconomy strategy, which was published uh, in December last year, and the topic of today's, events, uh, today's event, which is Nature Inspired Solutions. So a bit about what I'll cover in this 15 minute talk. Um, so a bit about the bioeconomy strategy, what it is, what it sets out, what it hopes to achieve, the links to nature inspired solutions, and if I get time, a bit about what we plan to do next. So the UK bioeconomy strategy sits within a wider framework of government action uh, for clean growth. So firstly, the UK's industrial strategy published in November 2017, sets out how we're building a Britain that's fit for the future. It sets out how we will help businesses create uh, better, high-paying jobs with investment in the infrastructure, industries and skills of the future. We will boost productivity and earning power across the country by focusing on five foundations. Ideas, people, infrastructure, business environment and places. Within the industrial strategy, it introduces a number of grand challenges where the UK has the potential to lead in addressing some of the largest challenges of our time. One of these is clean growth. The clean growth strategy addresses this by setting out our proposals for decarbonising all sectors of the UK economy throughout the next decade. It explains how the whole country can benefit from low carbon opportunities while meeting national and international commitments to tackle climate change. Looking more widely, the 25-year environment plan sets out our goals for improving the environment within a generation, leaving it in a better state than how we found it. It details how we in government will work with communities and businesses to do this over the next 25 years. And lastly, the resource and waste strategy, published in uh, December 2018, sets out how we plan to double resource productivity and eliminate avoidable waste of all kinds by 2050. The strategy sets out how we preserve our, our stock of material resources by minimising waste, promoting resource efficiency and moving towards a circular economy, how we will minimise the damage caused to our natural environment by reducing and managing waste safely and carefully, and how we will deal with waste crime. Together, these strategies are creating the right environment for the bioeconomy to thrive, which I'll move on to now. So Wednesday the 5th of December last year saw the publication of the UK's first bioeconomy strategy. Alongside this, we also published the government response to the bioeconomy call for evidence, which came before the strategy. The intention of this strategy is to set out a framework for how we'll grow the bioeconomy looking out to 2030. It's not an answer in itself. It is the starting point to transforming our bioeconomy and will evolve continued efforts from government, industry and the research community to turn our ambitions into reality. So what is the bioeconomy that the strategy is seeking to grow? Simply put, uh, or not simply put, this strategy defines the bioeconomy as representing the economic potential of harnessing the power of bioscience using renewable biological resources to replace fossil resources in innovative products, processes and services. Building a world-class bioeconomy will transform our economy by removing our dependence on finite fossil resources. Bioscience and biotechnology have the potential to create new solutions that are economically and environmentally sustainable, as well as resource efficient. These solutions will help tackle global challenges and create opportunities in agri-food, chemicals, materials, energy and fuel production, health and the environment, along with many others. So a little bit more about the current bioeconomy in the UK. The wider bioeconomy represents over 5 million jobs across disciplines from bioscience and energy to healthcare and food and drink production. Direct jobs specifically in industrial biotechnology are estimated at over 14,000 across the UK, contributing 1.2 billion GBA to the economy. By working across sectors using our world-class expertise in industrial biotechnology and synthetic biology, we can have a transformative effect on multiple industries. The social, economic and environmental impacts of this could be vast. So the bioeconomy strategy sets out a number of high-level goals reflected in its 15 actions. The first of these is around capitalising on our world-class R&D, leveraging greater investment to turn our cutting-edge ideas into commercial success in the global marketplace. 
Secondly, it's about maximising productivity of our bioeconomy assets right across the UK, our knowledge, facilities and people to increase productivity from our existing renewable biological resources. Thirdly, it's about creating the right market conditions for novel bio-based products and services to thrive, raising public interest, increasing skills in the workplace and sales to the market. And lastly, we will support industry sectors to ensure that this strategy delivers real measurable benefits for the UK, creating jobs, increasing productivity and doubling the size of the impact of the bioeconomy to 440 billion by 2030. These goals will be achieved in the successful delivery of the strategy's 15 actions. These are spread across the five foundations of the industrial strategy. So these are ideas, infrastructure, business environment, people and places. So I wanted to give a few examples of the bioeconomy in action just to show the diverse potential of the sector. On the left here, you'll see an, uh, an advert from ExxonMobil, who've been working with synthetic genomics since 2009 to turn algae into low emission transportation fuel. At the bottom, the Seagas project, run by a consortium of six universities, research centres and other organisations, looked at the opportunities for generating sustainable energy by using seaweed as a feedstock. On the right, Nopla's edible water bottle, which was used at the London Marathon in April this year. Following this, the company have now received funding to develop condom and sachets made out of seaweed, which biodegrade as fast as a piece of fruit and are cheaper than plastic. So now to consider a bit of the links between these innovations in the bioeconomy and what we are here to discuss today, Nature Inspired Solutions. I see a range of similarities in nature-inspired solutions and the bioeconomy. Both in their source material and inspiration, nature, the natural world and biological organisms, but also in some of their aims to create a more sustainable world that addresses grand challenges through innovative products and services. Those that are more economically and environmentally sustainable and that use our resources more effectively. In other words, that the world surrounding us is key to our future. I think the similarities are particularly true when we consider the platform technologies of the bioeconomy, industrial biotechnology and synthetic biology. So utilising the promise of biology and the scientific knowledge that the, that the UK leads the world in is particularly true when it comes to our platform technologies. Platform technologies are those which encompass a suite of tools and methods that can be used for many applications both within and across sectors. We view industrial biotechnology and synthetic biology as being the key ones for the bioeconomy. Synthetic biology in particular looks at the building blocks of nature, applying engineering principles to biology to enable the design and synthesis of standardised and well understood biological parts. These can be used to develop biological systems and devices with potential applications ranging from chemicals, materials and agri-food to many more. At its roots, part of synthetic biology is understanding how nature is engineered. It's nature inspired. We know that these technologies have the potential for significant social, environmental and economic impacts across sectors. They draw together expertise from across different disciplines, including engineering, computing, life sciences and traditional manufacturing. So how does this play out in reality? Some of my favourite examples of nature-inspired solutions in the bioeconomy are in the material space. So, for instance, in the US, where a researcher team from the US Department of Energy, Oak Ridge and Lawrence, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, the University of California in Berkeley and the University of South Florida, took inspiration from cytophores in microorganisms, using this to develop a material that recovers uranium from seawater. Or back home in the UK, Alice Potts, based at Open Cell in Shepherd's Bush in London. Uh, she specialises in materials research of nature and the human body, focusing on biomaterials and their applications within the fashion industry, with a current focus on how we can use sweat to create our own accessories. Or Bio, also at Open Cell, a company allowing nature to lead innovation in the construction industry for a healthier, more sustainable business environment. We actually have Harry from Bio in the audience here. So the company are currently looking to develop a new construction system taking inspiration from the hexagon design found in nature, in beehives and carbon molecules for instance. 
And another interesting example of this can be found in Qatar, where nature-inspired solutions are being used in partnership with industrial biotechnology processes. If you imagine cool cucumbers growing in the middle of the world's hottest desert, the Sahara Forest Project has made that possible, with UN climate negotiations participants dining on the first harvest last November. The 10,000 square metre pilot facility in Qatar, which opened in December, hosts greenhouses irrigated by seawater. Engineers came up with their design by studying animals that have already evolved mechanisms for keeping cool in the desert, such as a camel whose nostrils evaporate and condense moisture, and the Namibian fog basking beetle, which extracts water from the balmy night air. The project is also based on a closed loop, zero waste, natural ecosystem. The greenhouse's operation relies on the temperature difference between warm surface seawater and cool water plumbed from deep underground. Both water sources flow to the site through separate pipes, which are pumped along by solar power. The warm surface water streams over an evaporative hedge, whereas you might guess it gets evaporated by the desert air. In turn, the surface water chills and dampens the desert air. That air then passes over the plants, keeping them cool and hydrated. Then that air pass, passes, pipe, passes past the pipes that pump the cool water from deep underground, condensing into fresh water. This seawater can also be used to grow algae, which can help produce biofuels. And in the future, similar greenhouses could be built to provide food, fresh water, green energy and employment across the Sahara and other desert regions. A perfect example of how projects can be inspired by nature and powered by bioscience. Just to finish off with a quick look at what is next. Nature inspired solutions could help unlock wider growth in the bioeconomy essential if we are to meet industry's ambitious target of doubling the bioeconomy's value to 440 billion by 2030. Now that the strategy is published, we are, deliver uh, we are beginning the next stage, delivery, working with stakeholders from industry, the research community and beyond. Ensuring the success of both the bioeconomy and nature-inspired solutions also rests with our community. In research published for the first time in the bioeconomy strategy, it, we show that people are very supportive of the bioeconomy once they are aware of what it is and its potential, but many people are still unaware. Raising awareness was also crucial for increasing the adoption of nature-inspired approaches and solutions. I believe that every one of us here today has a role in raising that awareness of the potential for both bio-based solutions and nature-inspired approaches and the benefits for both industry and the wider public so that together we can realise the impact of these approaches for the future. That's it from me. Please come and find me in the lunch break or after if you're interested in discussing any of this further. Thank you. Thanks um, very much, Gillian. I think I want to mention Dana again, our uh, KTM for biosynthetic uh, biote biote biotechnology, linking it to our bio... Uh, chemistry team and materials world. Uh, can I have uh, Leanne from Airbus now? Uh, I wanted to, uh, <coughs> thanks very much for coming, uh, to give you now a view from sort of big industry and where they are with R&D, uh, obviously in aer aerospace. Thanks very much for coming. So, hello everyone. Um, today I intend to share with you a little bit about nature-inspired technologies in Airbus. Um, my name is Leanne Ramsharita and I'm from Airbus Commercial Flight Physics Innovation. So much of what I share with you today will be from a commercial flight physics perspective. For those that are unfamiliar what flight physics encompass, I, it ranges between aerodynamics to loads, um, mass properties and um, aircraft performance as well as handling qualities of the overall aircraft. The essence of aviation has been inspired by nature just by the fascination of flight. So what more can we learn from, uh, from nature? If we asked a group of engineers uh, to design 
a one kilogram flying object that was capable of non-stop flight for 10,000 kilometers in less than 10 days. Some would look puzzled and think, well, <laughs> current technologies may not exist to support that. Um, Albert Einstein once said, look deep into nature and you will understand everything a lot better. The but, uh, the bar tail, the god bit, is capable and in, with incredible energy efficiency um, of crossing the Central Pacific from Alaska to New Zealand. This demonstrates a vast range of biological systems to behavioral strategies as well as simple design in which we could learn from. So without spending too much time on a history lesson. I just want to mention a few things through the evolution of aviation that has influenced or have been influenced by nature. In 1858, uh, Jean-Marie Le Brie, uh, claimed the first glided flight, which, looked, which had a boat-like uh, body uh, equipped with flapping wings, perhaps taken inspiration from albatross. And then a little later on, in about 1890, um, the first flying machine was constructed by Clement Adet. And uh, that was equipped with a lightweight uh, uh, steam-powered engine. And then not too long after that, the Wright brothers uh, observed that birds were able to have uh, to twist their wings in, in, recovery, in recovery from the gust destabilization and implemented this principle on the, the flyer aircraft in 1903. So over the years and less than 10 years after that, the, this uh, wing warping was replaced by movable surfaces such as ailerons and spoilers, which are still the norm today. So what else is still the norm today and what have we acquired? So at low speed, aircraft generally, uh, at low speed, such as uh, during landing, uh, we need to ensure that the sufficient lift is maintained to avoid stall, at the same time producing enough drag to slow down. What this means is that this needs to be ensured in a controlled and safe manner. We do this by deploying flaps and um, by deploying flaps, as well as increasing the angle of attack, very similar to the way birds do. But some birds have a small feather-like, uh, feather-covered um, projection on the anterior edge of the wing, called the allula, in which is, it's thought to say that they um, avoid, or at least avoid the onset of stall. This principle applies, and we've applied it to the use of slats in aircraft. So for high speed performance, however, drag needs to be reduced to its minimum to optimize and to reduce and to ensure that fuel burn is not significant. One of the ways in which large birds do this is they have feathers at the end to reduce the impact of uh, vortices at the wing wingtip ends. We do this by applying wingtip fences and similar to the A350 and uh, the A320, you can see here we call it chocolate. Uh, the chocolate has, or at least produces at least 3.5% uh, fuel burn reduction, which in aviation speak is quite significant. So 40% of the aircraft drag is actually induced by the lift just to carry its own weight. One of the ways to overcome this is to increase the wing span. However, these aircraft need to operate in and out of airports with existing infrastructure. One of the solutions to overcome this is by a folding wingtip. Most traditional concepts of the folding wingtip is that it is a rigid folding wingtip and in turbulent flow causes additional loads to be transmitted back into the wing structure and thereby needing additional structural reinforcement to ensure that it is safe and uh, maintain its structural integrity. What this adds is additional weight and drag, which then reduces and minimizes the benefit you would get from an increased um, wing span. 
So then a group of passionate Airbus engineers, led by my colleague Tom Wilson, had thought about the idea of the fact that the albatross is, has an unlockable shoulder. And we asked, and we asked ourselves, how can this principle be applied to our, our problem? And so they'd come up with a semi-aeroelastic semi hinge project. And the concept is that during cruise condition, it is a rigid um, uh, uh, folding wingtip, but during turbulence, is that it unlocks and um, it, it does not transmit any additional loading into the wing box structure, and there's no additional structural requirements or uh, structural reinforcements required. Uh, and thereby, thereby, we maximize the benefit of the increased wingspan. Um, so they went on to demonstrate this concept with a group of students and built a small-scale demonstrator called the Albatross One. Um, and these students, in partnership with the universities that you see on the, on the slide, um, built this in our proto space in Filton. And it is a, it is a proud uh, British innovation, I might I say, and um, I hope this video link is going to, to work. Let's see. Let me share this. I'm hoping they're sound, but... It's not showing up there. So what we'll do is... Apologies for that. We're trying live video, so let's focus technically. Okay. <laughs> what we'll do is... <coughs> No, that's not what we want, is it, folks? Oh, it's just, is that an advert? Yeah. No, here we go. Okay. okay, there are also, but we can let it ring in our heads in the meantime. <laughs> um, So this was first tested in um, uh, February of this year. Have a look at it. And this is when it's uh, in a rigid position. And then you can see at the end the um, unlockable hinge. <coughs> the future of flight hinges on Albatross One. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, the, the, I'm not quite done with my presentation. <laughs> okay, just bear with me while we go back to our... Uh, oh yeah? Okay, it's all yours. Okay. Um, so the next step for the Albatross one is to build a full-scale demonstrator, but though that's in several years to come. I'm conscious that I've spoken quite a bit about birds, and I think the other creatures of this planet are feeling a little left out. So, um, generally speaking, most aerodynamicists prefer smooth surfaces to ensure laminarity and to reduce drag. However, um,
second. It's not. Um, Um, so sharks have a groove-like structure on their skin, which helps them to enhance their speed and performance. This has been tested on our on Airbus aircraft and flight test and demonstrated increased uh, performance improvement and reduced fuel burn. Similarly, certain leaves have uh, microstructures on their leaf, which helps the droplets to clean the surface in, um, to, in a self-cleaning manner. So regardless of how dry or wet the environment, it maintains a clean surface. Uh, this concept could potentially be used and equipped on cabin uh, fittings to, in its self-cleaning mechanism and possibly later in the future. Um, it could be even used to prevent um, ice accretion on the wings. So I have to mention birds just one more time. So uh, in terms of the fact that birds display for, um, a quite efficient formation flights and optimize their energy efficiency, uh, they could, we could potentially take learning from this energy management on our aircraft and how we could uh, capitalize on such a uh, on such a principle and well further into the future we hope that uh, aircraft will be more adaptive more responsive and perhaps um, re more yeah more reactive to the environment in which it is so whether it's through adaptive wingtips leading edge um, and through smart memory alloy materials the range goes on um, and for even smart actuators, for example, um, really just trying to make the aircraft more adaptive to the surrounding. But that's well in the future. It does come with many of these like, technologies that are low in maturity that need further insight and further study. Uh, comes with many challenges to actually implement on, uh, on an aircraft, particularly for commercial purposes. Uh, Industrialisation is one of the major challenges. We still need to make these technologies. It needs to satisfy the rates in which the aviation market demands from us. Um, how do we fulfil that? And many of the technologies that are quite unique and they fit in um, a very unique and niche environment where it's been tested in a lab, perhaps in a very ideal situation. situation. And it is important for us to ensure that it, it meets the application in which it's going to be used. And if we look at the overall picture and consider the bigger picture, these technologies will sometimes require additional systems installation, additional weight, structural reinforcement. This adds weight and thus it requires or at least induces additional drag and then increases our fuel consumption. And these technologies need to ensure that in the frame of the bigger picture, it does have the expected benefits through cost, through liability, because it is an aircraft, it needs to be safe and it needs to demonstrate reliability as we are constrained and with the regulations to ensure a safe aircraft. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. This is fascinating, especially the live demo. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. So next up, I would like to introduce Daniel from Transport of London. Uh, I think his jo job title is something like responsible for co continuous improvements and innovation. And I think Perfect. managing this sort of uh, London ecosystem with the millions and millions of people is quite challenging. So tell us more. I'm really curious, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can just uh, move it forward. Then. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Rahman. Um, uh, for ease of pronunciation, just break the Rahamim down, not Daniel, you know, probably know that. Um, Rahamim into three sections, Rahamim, and then you speed it up, Rahamim. Uh, so that's how you remember. Okay, so... Um, I'm here to, well, firstly, I work for the major, oh, I'm not up yet, am I? There we go, here we go. Right, so uh, I'm a Head of Continuous Improvement and Innovation for the Major Projects Directorate. So the Major Projects Directorate is the Infrastructure Directorate for, for TfL. So that's um, 
big infrastructure projects like the Northern Line extension, Bakerloo Line extension, the Four Lines modernization, uh, modernization and the Deep Tube Upgrade program. I'll come on to those a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to start kind of at the top with, uh, with really the mayor and then TFL strategies and then work down to, to, to really the coalface, to the projects, um, where I think there's great opportunity to innovate. So why am I here? One of the reasons why I'm here is because actually um, we want to work with businesses and organisations that share our commitment to health, safety and the environment. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm here. So... What is TfL's position? Well, simply TfL's position. Uh, uh, we've signed up to the government's infrastructure carbon review. The ICR demonstrates the link between lower whole life carbon and lower life costs. And TfL needs to deliver uh, a zero carbon transport system by 2050 and a zero carbon rail network by 2030. This is set out in the mayor's transport and environmental strategies. Now, in order to, to reach this target, it's quite clear that we need to find new and innovative ways of delivering our programmes and projects. So, in terms of the, the targets, a little bit more detail, as you can see, there's a number of ambitions. Uh, on the top left, we have waste reduction. Um, looking down to the bottom, circular uh, uh, economy value. In the middle at the bottom, you've got the air quality improvement. Uh, target uh, up in the right, natural environment benefit. I won't go through all of them. You can get the slides later and have a look. Um, but important one again in the middle on the right is adapting to climate change. So let's break it down a bit further. What you see there in the uh, yellow, uh, sorry, green banner is the major projects directorate strategy. So this is our ambition when we're delivering projects. We want to promote sustainable and innovative designs, construction methods and materials that align to hierarchical risk management practices, prevent pollution and nu uh, nuisance and protect and enhance biodiversity. And they're all aligned to the below strategy. Some of them are mayoral strategy, TfL, others are government, but it's all aligned here. So we, we deliver our projects, we must focus on the management of environmental risk and opportunities. So, challenge number one. We're not calling them problems, we're calling them challenges. Challenge number one is rolling stock. So, I'm going to talk to you about London's arteries. We talked about arteries before, but this is London. So, this is the tube. Uh, and let's look at project, project level. So, this is a kind of coal face. What you see here is the Deep Tube Upgrade Program. And this part of the Deep Tube Upgrade Program is the upgrade of the Piccadilly Line. These are 94 very, very new trains, which we have uh, purchased, which we've put in a contract with Siemens, and they're to be delivered in four or five years' time. Now, what that brings with us is a, a number of challenges. The Piccadilly Line, I'm sure you'll all know, is a deep tube line and it is constrained by this space. It's very small. Uh, we need to call cool these trains because custom expe customers expect uh, um, that kind of transport, a cooled train. But if you've been on a train, there is not a lot of room for an air conditioning unit. Big challenge for us there. So, our next challenge, and the rolling stock, is then we have 87 very, very old trains because we left with them. Now, what do we do with those? The 73 stock was built in the era of asbestos, so we have, uh, have to identify hazardous materials. This is uh, incredibly important for the safety of our, 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 our workers. Um, and what do we do with the old stock? Uh, currently, old stock, a couple go to, to, to a museum in Acton, a couple maybe go to uh, <laughs> it's a lovely museum, you should visit. Um, <laughs> a, a couple go to, 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 to maybe some, some uh, schools, but really, we don't do anything but scrap them, and, and, and there's really little benefit in them. So what can we do with these trains? Maybe there's something we can do. Cleverly. The next challenge, dust. Dust is incredibly uh, uh, important. Um, this is a major health concern. Uh, this is for our customers and our staff. Um, the friction from braking 
uh, between the wheels and the tracks uh, causes a harmful pollutant dust to come off. And this is a, a challenge that we need to address for the safety of our staff and customers. Okay, challenge number three, noise and vibration. I work in Stratford and I get the central line in and out of London to Stratford. I often take in my colleagues uh, or clients and uh, you often end up in mid-conversation stopping and sort of doing this because of the noise on, on the train and, and then you start again and stop looking. Have these uncomfortable silences. We need to work on the noise. Not just for the noise for our customers, but the noise and vibration for our staff and the noise and vibration caused by construction as well. So as I mentioned, big infrastructure program, lots of projects happening in central London. Um, but also, uh, we need to look at the, the noise caused by, by our night tube. Uh, I'm not sure if many people have used the night tube, but we're now operating 24 hours a day on certain lines. So there's a, uh, there is a, a challenge there. And lastly, my biggest, biggest bugbear, heat. I'm sure a number of you have experienced that. I'm going to show you a poster I have. So I don't know if you can read that, but it says... The underground's the only spot for comfort when the days are hot. It's cooler below. And I bet 99% of you are sitting in here right now going, what are you on about? You've got to be kidding. So that's actually a poster from 1926. Now, does anybody know why the uh, tube is so hot? Why is it hot down there? Anyone? The air cannot get out. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that. It's incorrect, but I'm going to use it. Well, maybe it's just slightly correct. The reason is clay. London clay. London clay, <coughs> unfortunately, is around about 14, and the tunnels were built so long ago that 90% the of the heat uh, uh, goes into the clay and absorbs around the tunnels, and it stays there. And this is one of the reasons it's so hot. Now, Obviously, these lines were built in Victorian times when they really wasn't of a concern. Um, but what it means is our, our temperatures are, are, are close to Milan and Mexico City. And I've been to both those places, and it, the weather's not like this outside. It's very, very different. It's very hot. So not only do we have the challenge of, of, of bringing this out, but when we upgrade our lines, for example, the Piccadilly line, as I showed you, the train, when you upgrade that line, we're talking about 60% increase in capacity. And the way in which we do this is by increasing the frequency of the trains. They increase the frequency of the trains, the heat's going to rise again. And there aren't ventilation systems in place to extract that. So how do we get rid of the heat? Um, and that's one of our, our, our biggest challenges that we have. So, the clay, damn clay. So, what would nature do to tackle our challenges? And then what could you do to solve our problems? So, you have the brains and the ideas in this room, and I have the infrastructure and the challenges. So, uh, let's work together. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, yeah, so thanks very much for this uh, inspiring talk and also thank you to you um, who fed us, you know, fed challenges to us. So we hope we're going to, we try to solve them in the afternoon. Um, or not solve them, sorry, I do over, tense over promise. We try <laughs> to bring people together that could help solving them. So this was the day so far. I think it was really exciting. At least I'm really, um, I want to thank the speakers again. I'm really inspired uh, by their work and also by the huge amount of challenges that is out there and that we can hopefully find people help solving them. Before uh, I leave you to go into your lunch break, uh, I want to remind you, because that was very brief before, about please do use our LinkedIn group. 
uh, register. There's a link in the presentation. We'll share that afterwards and also use it for your purposes. You know, put some, some ideas in there, ask for staff or just read what we put out there, like um, information about grants or interesting projects that need collaborators, things like that. We also will have a newsletter where we'll try to send periodic updates. So if you want to register for that, there is a link in there as well. You can also find that on the KTN website from um, 19th of, of July. Um, I want to remind uh, as well about this uh, Nature Inspired Engineering Conference that um, Mark Olivier was mentioning. I, um, I was asked to do an industry uh, workshop sort of facilitating from the KTN there and I'm really thrilled to be there. It's, uh, in, uh, it's a conference that is nearly a week starting at the 8th of September till the um, 13th of September. It is possible to join only partly as well with a reduced price. Um, and um, as um, we have to say um, goodbye to our uh, people uh, online now shortly, I want to just say uh, mainly for them, but also for you later, if you wouldn't mind um, sending us feedback on the event. So that's very simple. You just uh, enter www.wmenti.com in uh, your you know, search bar and then put in a code 105353 and then uh, just um, put some questions out about the event, uh, the content and also sort of where should we move because it's the start of our, our work and we want to get some insight. That's the action and then just a bit of an overview what's next. So I'm very um, um, pleased that um, my colleague uh, Jake from our DAI team, Design and Effect Innovation Effectiveness, uh, has uh, volunteered to uh, create the next event, which will be called The Nature of Design and will be on 10th of October in Birmingham. Uh, so you uh, can already register. Learning from this experience, we have uh, put the event on expression of interest and then we try to get a really good mix in the room. There will be uh, most likely uh, also a similar size event uh, in Edinburgh because obviously we want to spread the, the, the message mm -hmm. uh, as well in other areas of the UK. That should be end of November, beginning of December. And then uh, we are planning a big showcase sort of with more uh, people, that, um, as you can see downstairs, uh, for the next, um, so for Q1 2020. Uh, as this is a small project, uh, and uh, thanks to uh, my funder Innovate UK for being able to do the projects, we could need a sponsor for a showcase. So if you are uh, financially able and want to showcase a sponsor, then we would be very happy to talk to you. Um, we will also in the future have more sector specific uh, topological workshop where we work on specific <coughs> problems, but that is sort of more towards the next year. It is, I didn't mention that at the beginning, it's a two years project. So uh, the uh, funding and the topic as such will come to a close in March 2021. So we have a bit of time to do exciting stuff. Um, also in the room, uh, we have a consultant that we have cons contracted, Simon Olival. Could you give a wave? So he's here right in behind. And he wants to use the opportunity to meet you. Um, so whoever registered and said it's okay to be contacted uh, you know, by delegates, he could approach you because then we can share the email address. If you didn't say that and you still would like to contribute to the commercial opportunity report and landscape mapping, please do see Simon and introduce yourself, give him the card, that's the easiest because we cannot share, uh, obviously for GDPR reason, any contacts. So, um, yes, so thanks very much, uh, especially to the people who participated in the webcast. Um, we will um, share the link and I think um, recording presentations. If you have questions, do get in touch and we say goodbye here uh, on the webcast for now. Yep.